Um, so thank you all for coming to Politics and Prose Bookstore. My name is Adam Waterus, and it is my pleasure to introduce David Downey, a travel, food, and wine writer, author of Paris, Paris, A Journey into the City of Light, Quiet Corners of Rome, and others, and of course, Paris to the Pyrenees, A Skeptic Pilgrim Walks the Way of St. James, which is what you are all here for tonight. Um, Mr. Downey's pilgrimage um, begins, of course, in Paris and continues towards Spain, where the typical pilgrimage by today's standards would just begin. Downey's pilgrimage is personal and eccentric and revelatory in many ways for the author, but remains so as well for the reader, who is rewarded with an enigmatic, enigmatic view of a rural France few will see. I know we've got a lot of um, old acquaintances and, uh, and family and friends here, so um, I just want to leave it at that. Um, and uh, please join me in welcoming David Downey. Thank you, Adam. And um, I just want to thank uh, Politics and Prose for existing and continuing to thrive and for having me here. And uh, I want to thank all of you for coming. Some of you have come from a long way, and I'm very touched. And I'm very happy to see you, although you must understand that I actually just see a blur out there. Um, and I apologize for the get up, but I have very bad low vision. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to see you. You all look like you're smiling, <laughs> which is great, because I need it. Um, I have always believed that it's better to laugh than to cry. And I just want to say very quickly that um, you know there are lots of things in my book that are jokey and silly and I'm going to read some things and talk about some things in a uh, a light-hearted way tonight but I uh, I think we're all uh, very upset about what happened in Boston and I just want to take a second to say that uh, I'm, I'm very sorry that it happened, and I, th I think we're all thinking of them, and I, th I think we should uh, offer up some kind of a secular or uh, religious prayer, if you prefer, uh, to the people who, who were wounded or, or died and, and their families. Uh, I just heard about it as we were coming over, and, and, and it's, it's, it's upset me, in part because we have lived in Paris for a very long time, and I saw um, a bomb go off in Paris uh, when I first moved there. And uh, so uh, I, I, I'm, I'm just very sorry that this has happened tonight. Um, my pilgrimage, if you will, uh, was very peculiar. Um, most people who do this uh, walk, start out in um, Roncevaux, that's what the French call it, or uh, Roncesvalles in the Spanish Pyrenees, and they hike west to Compostela. And that's about 500 miles, 800 kilometers. And it takes them a month, month and a half, two months. It depends how fast they walk. Because, um, I don't know, I'm a quirky person. Uh, I decided that I didn't actually want to walk through Spain at all. I wanted to walk across France. And uh, we stopped at uh, Roncevaux. That's, that was the goal. The goal was to get over the Pyrenees. Um, the book is titled Paris to the Pyrenees, but we didn't actually walk from Paris all the way to the Pyrenees or else we would have called it from Paris to the Pyrenees. Um, the fact of the matter is that Paris is a rather large city, as some of you know. Uh, the greater Paris area is about 12 million, and um, we did try to hike out of town. But um, when you walk on the old pilgrimage route, uh, the Rue Saint-Jacques, after a couple of miles, you come to a, uh, a barrier, which is the Beltway. And that was built in the 1970s, or finished in the early 70s by 
the wonderful Georges Pompidou, president of France, who gave us all the highways and the commuter trains and the nuclear power stations and all the you know wonderful infrastructure and some of it not so wonderful. Um, and I somehow don't think he consulted with um, St. James or, or the church before he did that. Uh, we also actually took a couple of hiking trails to get out of town. We tried to do that, and we crossed the, uh, the Bois de Vincennes, which is a huge parkland on the eastern edge of Paris. And we did manage. You can go out there, and we got out to Joinville and these other places in the suburbs. But um, the, the trouble is that you then have train lines and freeways and housing developments and industry, and it's not very pleasant. Um, we, we didn't do this uh, to suffer and to martyr ourselves, and we didn't do it to win a race uh, or compete with anyone. Um, some of the interviewers who've uh, talked to me about the book um, seem to think that we were sort of walking along with pebbles in our shoes, lashing ourselves or something <laughs> over horrible terrain with no food or water or any. I mean, there were a, a few moments that were a bit dicey. But by and large, you know, we stayed in bed and breakfasts that were pretty comfortable or little hotels. A couple of times, you know, we did stay in some um, hostels for pilgrims. Uh, we had some fantastic meals. And as a only partially regenerate uh, uh, glutton and epicure uh, who has fought and lost the Battle of the Bulge for decades, uh, I can say that we had several uh, not just memorable meals, but I think one of the best meals that I have ever had in France. And I've been there for quite a long time. Um, so yes. It was very rough. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? Every morning we had to get up and have breakfast and stretch because we were kind of stiff and then go out and walk all day and see wonderful things and uh, eat wonderful things and meet mostly I interesting people if they didn't run away from us. Uh, that was one of the challenges. I was about to say problems, but I realize I'm not in France and you can't say problem in America. Uh, a lot of uh, the rural French uh, seem to think of pilgrims or hikers or anyone who's not from their village as uh, the, the local, the, the, the latest wave of barbarians. And so they would see us on the horizon and they would retreat. and. You know, slam the doors, pull up the drawbridges, close the shutters, turn off the water in the villages, and uh, you know, and this actually did happen a few too many times. It was amusing the first time around. <laughs> the second, third, and tenth time around, um, we wondered what was going on. Um, uh, just the other day, meaning I think two or three days ago, I'm still jet lagged. Uh, there was a story in the New York Times, I suspect some of you saw it, about the uh, uh, French importing foreign priests because there are, no, there are not enough priests in France anymore. And this one fellow from Togo has gone to Burgundy and his parish, or he has many parishes, but he's based in a place called Saint-Vallier. Well, we walked right by Saint-Vallier and he said in, in this article to the journalist that after several years of being there, the people still will not touch him or shake his hand or have anything to do with him. And they sort of, uh, they come to hear his sermons or go to mass and then they sort of scamper away. And so I read that and I felt better because <laughs> I thought, you know, uh, granted I, I, I don't have them with me. I, I wear these kind of goggles because I can't stand light. And I always wear a hat for the same reason. And, you know, after you've been hiking for a while, you get pretty, um, well, you look pretty rough. And uh, so thank God Allison was with me, because otherwise we probably would have starved to death or <laughs> died of thirst. 
Um, a journalist a couple of weeks ago asked me why I had decided to do this with my wife. And I, and I had to stop her and say, well, you know, uh, we didn't do it my way. We did it our way. And in some ways, we did it Allison's way, too. Um, if anybody here has ever tried to take a walk, let alone a 750-mile one with a photographer, <laughs> I suspect you will understand me when I say that um, we were together mostly in spirit and <laughs> often not in body because um, one of Allison's nicknames is, is antelope or gazelle. And as we walked along, uh, she was bounding ahead and taking photos, or I'd look for her, and she'd gone off there and there, and then I'd look back. And so, and there were many days where one of she got lost, or I got lost, or uh, we, we actually walked separately a, a lot of the time. And even when we were walking together, um, we often walked in silence. Now, this was very unusual for me because I actually uh, talk a lot. And uh, Allison uh, often intervened to, in a very polite way, tell me to be quiet or stop ranting about something. Um, but we both learned to walk largely in silence um, because this uh, pilgrimage uh, is in part about silence. And one of the reasons that um, I would have done it on my own if Allison hadn't wanted to come with me was that I was craving silence. Um, we live in the center of Paris in a, a very busy, uh, lively part of town. Paris is a very uh, a wonderful city. It's also very noisy. And um, I have, as I you know, motor along through middle age, I've come to appreciate silence more and more. It's very difficult to think in a place where you're being bombarded all the time by sound. So one of the wonderful things about this pilgrimage was just reconnecting with silence. And like that old song says, the silence has a sound. It really does. It, it, it hums. And some of the most silent, magical places, and this, this coming from a non-believer, um, were the churches, the refuges we went into along the way. And there, there is something absolutely wonderful about coming upon one of these isolated churches and being able to go in and sit there in the semi-darkness. It's usually cool. And just hear the silence humming. Um, another one of the wonderful things about pilgrimage is that you discover or you rediscover this paradoxical sense of timelessness. There's a timelessness of time. You know that time is going by, but you lose track of it. And w when we started out, um, we both had these pedometers, and I had bought one that talked <laughs> and squawked and made these ridiculous noises and told us how many calories we were burning and what the time was and, you know, all of this. Uh, Allison had a very silent one, of course, uh, German-built and much more efficient than mine. And so, you know, a couple of times we would hike into a town or a village and uh, go into the church and my pedometer would say, 3.2 kilometers, and so, um, when finally, after, I don't know, 10 days or 12 days of, of walking, 
um, I looked down to check how far we had walked and discovered I dropped it or it had fallen off or <clears throat> somebody had uh, unhooked it. Uh, I felt a a great sense of liberation, and Allison did too, <laughs> maybe even more than I did. So whether you're religious or not, or spiritually inclined uh, or not, uh, time and this sense of losing time is, 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 is wonderful. Um, another thing, it's you know, really down to earth, and that is down to earth, being down to earth. You're walking and you're reconnecting your body with the soil, with the seasons, with what's going on. You feel it as you walk. Uh, we were very fortunate. We were both walkaholics. We get up in the morning and go tearing around or limping, whatever, uh, every morning. And uh, so uh, we, we actually had n no blisters or anything. The, the entire way, um, we carried about 20 pounds of uh, Band-Aids and all this kind of stuff, but uh, we never got a chance to use them, which was one reason why whenever we saw a, a fellow hiker or pilgrim who, who had stopped to deal with a blister or something, Allison would go rushing up with the kit and offer them something. They usually sprang up and ran away because they... They're not used to, um, you know, sort of straightforward American behavior where you say hello and can I help you or something like that. It's just, it's just not done. Uh, um, this pilgrimage is like slicing into a layer cake. Um, or a millefeuille, if you prefer, it's France. There are so many layers of history and of culture that you walk along and you're nourished as you go by what you see and what you smell and what you hear, but also what you know or learn as you go along. So when we started out, we were consulting one of my all-time favorite books, uh, The Conquest of Gaul by Caesar, Julius Caesar, as you all know. Uh, it's a fabulous read. I suspect they stock it here. If they don't, they should. Um, and I would urge you all to read it because it's really ex extraordinarily interesting. Uh, if you're interested in France at all, you have to read it because you will learn uh, about ancient Gaul. It is the victor's version, of course, but there are so many fascinating things that you learn about the uh, forebears of the French that uh, ever after, as you walk along scratching your head and trying to figure out why something happened, you'll say, oh, yeah, Caesar talked about that. Um, because the French, like uh, lots of old cultures, are uh, wedded to the past, and that's not a judgment. Uh, often when the French who are uh, traditionalists uh, are attacked by the progressive side, uh, the word passeiste or, or passeisme is used as a kind of insult. But I think that uh, understanding and appreciating the past is actually uh, essential for keeping us out of trouble in the present and the future. And, you know, we need to uh, look at our past and move forward looking both ways. Um, in this book, I develop a theory which is anything but original uh, about the French, and I, I call France the uh, a Janus culture or a Janus nation because, as you know, the, the, the god of thresholds has two heads and he looks forward and backwards at the same time. And the French are like that. There are other cultures that are like that. France is very old. Italy is very old. The Middle Eastern countries have extremely old cultures. France has no monopoly on it. However, 
uh, even more so than the Italians, I would say the French are very interested in their past. So everywhere you go, you will see some sort of vestige of the past. And that adds to the wonder of this walk. Um, the layer, the layering effect also has to do with the road itself. Now in Paris, the uh, Rue Saint-Jacques used to be, or originally was, a, a Bronze Age trade route. And then when the Gauls showed up, they turned it into a road. And then when the Romans showed up, Caesar arrived and took over Paris in 52 BC, the winter of 52, 51 to be precise. And he improved the road and turned it into the main north-south axis, the uh, Cardo Maximus of Paris, and it's still there. In the Middle Ages, it was turned into the pilgrimage route. So that pilgrimage route, which runs all the way across France, is essentially built on layers, uh, modern, medieval, ancient Roman, ancient Gallic, and Bronze Age. And as you go along, it's not that you're looking down and you're saying, oh gee, you know, look what, what they did 3,000 years ago, this is great. Occasionally, you do see actual parts of the Roman road, and we walked on parts of the Roman road. Um, uh, in fact, our word for street comes from uh, 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 stratum and strata because the Romans built their road or roads in, in layers. So I was fascinated by that. I was also interested in the fact that um, the, the concept of pilgrimage is very ancient. Uh, we know that it goes back to Neolithic times and it, I suspect, goes much farther back than that. Because if you think of the, the cave paintings, um, uh, which were done in France in some cases 25,000 years ago or more, um, it, it, it is now thought that those grottos that were painted were in a way shrines uh, to commemorate uh, the dead often. Uh, it wasn't just to propitiate the hunt. That, that seems to have been discredited. The new theory is that these were shrines. And every time someone died, you would project an image of the animal that corresponded to the person or to the tribe or to the clan, and then you would draw an outline. And so if you think about it, people have been making pilgrimages for a very long time. Our word, pilgrim, comes from the French pèlerin, which comes from the Italian, or pellegrino, the Spanish saying, and the Latin peregrinus. If you think of a peregrine falcon, it flops along and goes, it just means traveler. A, a pilgrim is a traveler, and specifically a traveler in a, in a foreign land. And in fact, in ancient Roman times, um, in, the, in Republican times, um, anyone who was in Roman territory but not a Roman citizen was known as a peregrinus. Uh, I mention this because many people have asked me, you know, you're an atheist. Um, what right do you have to call yourself a pilgrim? And I say, well, you know, the Christians don't own the word or the concept. In fact, every religion has pilgrims. And uh, before there were codified religions that we know of, there were pilgrims. So I felt like a bona fide pilgrim. I'm a pilgrim here today because I'm not from here. And many of you aren't from here either. Uh, the, 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 the fate of man, I think, is to be on a kind of constant pilgrimage. Your life is a pilgrimage, whether it's commuting, going back and forth to work, or traveling around. Um, this was the other thing that kind of, the, the, the low watt epiphany that dawned on me, that, um, that pilgrimage simply means 
getting through life. Now, if I could get through life by walking on a trail and going to a and b and having great meals every night and getting up and walking the next day and knowing that that's what I was going to do, well, I'd, I'd be a professional pilgrim. <laughs> and I suspect many of you would be. Uh, which brings me to the point that uh, professional pilgrims were uh, very common, uh, certainly in the Middle Ages and right up into the 18th century until the, uh, the French Revolution. The wealthy actually paid people like runners to carry messages to the saint and uh, ask him for a favor or ask him to intervene in some way. And now when Allison and I reached Le puy en velay which is uh, on the edge of the Massif Central, so about, I don't know, 500 miles south of Paris, something like that, um, it, it's not that we had converted and become Catholics, but we actually went in to the church and got a credentiel, which is where we get the word credential. Um, that is a pilgrim's passport, which is issued by the Catholic Church. And the reason we did that was that it allowed us to stay in hostelries along the way, hostels, uh, for a very modest amount of money. And we also wanted a beautiful document with a lot of scallop shells on it. Because as you know, St. James, uh, his, his symbol is the scallop shell. Um, in Spain, the last um, uh, statistics I saw said there's something like 200,000 or more on the Spanish side. Um, we uh, saw many, starting in Le Puyon uh, Velay, there were many in Vesle too, a, a fewer than in uh, Le Puyon Velay. We spent much of the time hiking on secondary routes, um, in part because, as I said, these are extremely old uh, pilgrimage routes or trade routes. And there used to be a very important uh, pilgrimage route between Vesle and Cluny. I, I suspect a lot of you know that Cluny, which is now a town of about 5,000, um, had the biggest abbey outside of, well, it was the biggest church outside the Vatican for many, many years. It was extremely powerful, extremely rich. And the abbot of Cluny uh, basically ran things along the pilgrimage routes for many, many centuries. Uh, Cluny built most of the uh, hostelries and, and monasteries. Uh, in the early 19th century, Cluny was quarried, and there's only part of the compound left. Uh, and the pilgrimage routes disappeared. So everyone bypasses it. But I was very interested in taking that older route across Burgundy, uh, also because that uh, is where Caesar fought the uh, Gauls in the conquest of Gaul. So we carried the conquest of Gaul with us, and Allison very kindly and patiently read to me from it in the battlefields and the lost city of the Gauls at Bibracht, where uh, Caesar um, dictated the book. And, and that added to the experience. Um, so essentially, there were many, many layers to our experience. Um, spiritual, I, I don't know because I have, uh, I have difficulty defining what spiritual means. Um, I'm not a religious person. I hope I'm not irreligious, but I also have to live up to my reputation as an irreverent curmudgeon, which some uh, critics have um, called me, which is fine. I, I mean, I am basically a curmudgeon. I, I wrote a lot of um, 
uh, restaurant criticism, and, and, and I was pretty curmudgeonly, in part because I wanted people to get good food, and I was tired of getting what the French call réchauffé, which means reheated. <laughs> and uh, just before flying over here, uh, I heard a report on the French radio that said that um, an, an estimated eight in 10 French restaurants now serve du réchauffé. So they go out to these hypermarkets for chefs and buy bottled coco vin and bourguignon and whatnot and stick them in the microwave. And in fact, where we live in Paris, underneath us, there are all these restaurants and we hear beep, 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 which is not great. Um, I was going to read you, I've probably blathered on and on. What time is it? Ooh. I'm late. I'm over. All right. I'll I'll, I'll read you something very uh, very briefly. <clears throat> this is the the essentially the beginning of the book, a, a, a chapter called Saints Alive. <clears throat> the storied medieval pilgrimage site of Vesle stretched lengthwise across a hogback Burgundian ridge like a patient on a psychiatrist's couch. At the head of the hill was the Romanesque repository of Mary Magdalene's relics. Our hotel stood near the former fairgrounds at the saint's feet. The simile seemed imperfect. I'd heard much about the site's purported psychotherapeutic powers, though no psychiatrist's couch I've seen is ringed by tall, crumbling walls, studded with belfries and surrounded by Pinot Noir vineyards and cow-flecked pastures. As a seriously overweight free thinker with wrecked knees, a crazed individual proposing to walk 750 miles on pilgrimage routes, perhaps my vision of Vesley was impaired by a skeptical outlook, and I was the one who needed a therapist. Outwardly, the irrepressible desire I felt to hike across France had little to do with spirituality, a profitable concept whose meaning has never been clear to me. After 20 years of living and working in France, I simply felt the need to make my own mental map of the country by walking across it step by measured step and thereby possess it physically, intimately, something I'd failed to do through a car's windshield. I also needed to reinvent myself from the bottom up, restore something I'd lost, discover things I'd never tried to find, make an inner as well as an outer journey, and ask the big questions again, the what's it all about alfy ones I'd stopped asking once out of adolescence. Among those fundamentals was, did I want to stay alive or did I prefer to explode like an overinflated balloon? A quarter century of high living as a travel and food writer had demanded its pound of flesh, many pounds actually. I'd become a hedonist and glutton. The cookbooks I'd written, the recipes I'd tested, the buttery croissant and fluffy mousses I'd savored in every imaginable locale, from bakery to multiple-starred restaurant, had buried me in radial tires like the Michelin Man. One fine day, while eating my way through southern Burgundy, I'd keeled over and awakened to be told I was, in essence, a walking foie gras. <laughs> I'd become a life-sized, green-hued liver an organ afflicted by something called steatosis. A second French doctor leaned over my hospital bed and nodded with undisguised disgust. He explained that steatosis means marbled with fatty veins and pocked with fatty globules. I also had viral hepatitis, probably from food poisoning. I was, in short, experiencing liver failure. Um, so that was the um, initial motivation for my walk. There were many others, and I suspect that if, if you persevere and read the book, you'll discover that there was more to it than just physical regeneration. I've probably gone far too long. Uh, you okay? Oh, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll read you. Hmm. That's the New York Times. It doesn't want to be ignored but it does ignore me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're, we're still in Vesle, 
Uh, now, as, as you all know, Vesle is a, uh, a medieval hill town uh, with a, uh, a basilica dedicated to Mary Magdalene, and um, it claims to have her relics. Uh, the, the relics were de-authenticated by a papal bull in the uh, 1200s, but, you know, if people believe that they're authentic, that's, that's okay. They still draw crowds. Anyway, we started there because um, it was simply the best place to start walking. And also because, as someone who's obsessed with Roman roads and Roman history and the clash of Rome and Gaul, um, I knew that the Via Agrippa, the consular highway, ran through there. In fact, the original uh, village was called uh, Vesiliacum, and Agrippa and Caesar and everyone else went trotting through. And when the Vikings came in in the ninth century, over and over, and and and, and destroyed it, and destroyed the uh, the nunnery which was down by the river in the lower town, and abducted the nuns, and soon there were none. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the town was moved up onto the top of this hill. So the town on the hill that everyone goes to see is only 1,200 years old. The town below that nobody wants to see, which is actually fascinating, is an ancient Roman town built on top of an ancient Gallic town, of course. Anyway, so we were there at Easter. And on Easter Eve, we, we went to the ceremony, which was absolutely spectacular. Darkness has its advantages. The basilica's homely facade had undergone a transformation. Illuminated by spotlights, it hovered and glowed, an amber-colored hologram against the indigo sky. I thought for a minute about my confused state of mind and realized I was wrestling with holograms of my, own, of my mind's own making. Inside the enclosed porch, the darkness teemed. I could barely see. A woman handed me two wax tapers with white paper hoods. A choir of voices emanated from the basilica's nave. A figure in robes appeared, his fa face lit by a flickering taper. He positioned himself beneath the central tympanum, stooped, and lit a fire. As if led, fed by gasoline, the fire exploded into a blaze. It cast the priest's shadow upward across the tympanum where Christ reigned. A dog-headed man in the figure of St. James glared down at us. With flames leaping and shadows prancing around him, the priest spoke. I could not make out what he was saying. I grappled with slippery emotions. My mind jumbled with thoughts of the primal fire, the eternal flame and the campfires of my childhood. The priest tipped his taper and lit the candles of the men and women standing nearest. They lit others' candles. One by one, the twinkling points of light illuminated arms, necks, and faces, a throbbing canvas, and then a bell tinkled. Unable to speak from the emotion, I pressed Allison's hand. As I lit her candle, her face leapt out of the darkness. I caught my breath as the basilica's giant doors yawned open. The faithful broke into song. Their faces painted by childlike grins made strange in the dancing candlelight. I felt myself slipping into an intoxicating oneness with my fellow human beings, the torchbearers, the happy, the saved, the faithful. But as the assembly filed from the porch into the nave and the spotlights came up to enchanting harpsichord music, the stagecraft overwhelmed the authenticity. My cheeks burned with shame. I'd been hoodwinked. I'd hoodwinked myself. Shuffling forward, my candle before me, I felt like a walk-on in a cultish theater performance. The bone china spell had broken. Toto had dragged open the curtains, revealing the wizard of Vesle. The words of an aged atheist friend spoken years before welled up from memory. If I had to do it again, I'd be a Catholic, she'd said with a wicked smile, for the pageantry, the ritual, the marvelous hocus pocus. It was marvelous. With incense, bonfire, and candles burning, we took seats in the artfully lit nave. 
Plato's cave transmogrified by the brothers and sisters of Jerusalem, keepers of this extraordinary temple. I sneezed and felt at once foolish and guilty, a spy in the house of love all over again. The Easter Eve sound and light of extravaganza segued into the days of creation, but my teeth chattered from the cold and my backside went numb at the thought of a French version of intelligent design. As the fourth day of creation dawned, I rose silently from my seat and stole out of the basilica. The harpsichord's notes played up my spine and the candles became voices roaring with skeptical fury. So um, that was a really rough moment for me uh, because we were just getting started and I, I, I really didn't know whether I was going to face the prospect of going through this very intense experience of dealing with uh, what had always been militant atheism and walking down a pilgrimage route. Um, what I will say is that um, I think that by the time I crested the Pyrenees, I had become uh, much more tolerant and appreciative of the churches that we stopped in and in great admiration of the art and the architecture and also um, of many of the people who were running these churches, the priests uh, that, that we spoke to, um, who said things that made a lot of sense you know, beyond the, the fact that they were Catholic priests. And I think that one of the really great things about um, this kind of experience is that it really forces us to rethink and rethink everything. You know, you're walking uh, with your thoughts for months at a time and you go over everything that's ever happened to you. And you think about all those big questions that you didn't think you were ever gonna have to deal with again. And uh, if you think about it, it's probably worth about 10 years of um, psychoanalysis, so it was cheap. I mean, I, not that I've done it, but uh, uh, I mean, I did a little when I had my eye problem and thought that uh, I was going to go completely blind. So I can tell you that this kind of thing is extremely therapeutic. And I could go on and on and read on and on, but I think I'd better take some questions because otherwise we'll be here until nine o'clock. Thank you. No questions? We can go to dinner? <laughs> Sorry. Did a question here. Uh, when you started your pilgrimage, did you intend to write a book about it? And if so, how did that affect your journey and your persistence or your attitude? Um, an excellent question. Um, did I know I was going to write a book? Uh, no. I suspected I might because I do that to earn a living, but I also do it because I've, I've been writing books since I was a teenager. Luckily, the first 50 or 60 didn't get published. Um, and I uh, am almost pathological in terms of taking notes. Uh, this was totally analog. I just carried lots of notebooks with me, and I filled the notebooks. Um, so I, it, it, it didn't change the experience other than the fact that I was observing everything as closely as I could because I've been a journalist for decades and, and a, a, re, a reporter, put it that way. And so I just wanted to record things in part so that I would then remember where we had been when I had this incredible thought about, you know, why the French drive like maniacs, and I had read in Caesar about how wonderful they were at building chariots and uh, ran people over on the consular highways, and I said, my God, they've always been this way, that kind of thing. And, um, 
questions? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> tell us, if you will, a little bit about your daily routine. You got up and ate your croissant and all that kind of stuff and headed off with 100 pounds on your back and all this kind of thing, and you made so many miles per day and not on your back. Uh, <coughs> um, yeah, I had 100 pounds on my <laughs> in my saddlebags. You but, stopped uh, for lunch and so on. You tell us about that. Um, yeah, it was very simple. Uh, we got up early, uh, probably not by Washington standards because everyone here seems to get up at 5 or 6.30 or whatever. Anyway, uh, we sprang out of bed every morning uh, full of beans and uh, we did our stretches and yoga and the things we always do. And then we had breakfast, whatever we could get our fangs into, uh, you know, usually bread or croissant or whatever they had going. Um, and then we set off and walked until, you know, noon or so. So we'd walk three or four hours and then usually have a picnic that we bought somewhere and rest a bit and then walk again for two or three or four hours. It would depend how many miles we had to cover that day. We averaged um, 10 miles a day. Some days we walked twice that and some days we walked less than that because before we set out, what I had to do was get all the survey maps and figure out where we were going to stay and if there was a and b or a hotel or a hostel or something and a place to get food. It's not... Uh, 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 we, we, we did not carry tents and stoves and things like that. We're too old for that. I mean, I did that as a teenager all over the place, and, and we were not going to do that. Allison has a bad back, and so we carried uh, as little as we could, and we stopped at three post offices in the first week and sent back all of Allison's stuff, practically, because she had six books and you know, dinner dresses and uh, you know, all these <laughs> things that, anyway, I'm, exa I'm exaggerating. I'm exaggerating. But we did mail a lot of stuff back to Paris, and we walked as light as we could. And in some places, uh, we asked the people who ran the B&B &B to, to take our packs to the next stop, if they would do that. Um, what the heaviest thing I carried every day was water because what we discovered very quickly was there's no water. There was no water, no drinking water. The villages were usually half empty or three quarters empty and, and often they just turned off the spigots and, and, and left. So uh, there were days when I was carrying four liters of water, which is uh, eight or nine pounds. So that adds up. Any other questions? You alluded to having militant athe atheism, but you said that you were in a couple of the churches along the way where the priests or other people running the church had some things that said some things that made sense. Mm. And it, could you share a couple of examples of those and how that obviously conflicted with your beliefs and if it changed or altered your thinking in any way, what they had to say that made sense? Yeah. Um, I would say that the the most intense um, exchange of that kind, well, put it this way, one, I had a couple of intense encounters with Buddhists and one uh, priest who ran the abbey at Konk, which is between the Massif Central and the southwest of, of France. A beautiful, beautiful abbey, uh, about a thousand years old, famous for its treasure of uh, Sainte Foy, this gold mask. Anyway, he, uh, they were all very affable, and I told him straight off that I wasn't a believer, and he, he didn't care. Uh, and I said, we had a long conversation, and, and I said, I is there anything that unites all of us, um, atheists, agnostics, believers. You see hundreds, thousands of, of, of people coming through here, and you've done this for decades. Is there any one thing we all have in common? And he right away 
said, yes, there is. Uh, you are all driven to do this. There is an irresistible drive to do this. You don't know why. And you may learn why while you're doing it, or afterwards, or five years afterwards, or 20 years afterwards, or you may never learn. Uh, but you're, you all have that if you're a real pilgrim and you're not just out for a hike for a couple of days. And he was absolutely right. I, I was driven, I was obsessive. You can ask my wife, I, I, was, I wouldn't give up on this. It took us a long time to set out because we were both busy trying to earn a living and we have books to do and at the, you know, articles and whatnot. And, uh, uh, so it was very difficult for us to break away and do this, and um, uh, I, I just wouldn't relent in, until we went. And uh, did I discover why? Yeah, I discovered many, many reasons why. And you know, as I've said before to to people who have asked me this, um, I, I set out with with a lot of questions, and I came back with even more questions, but. That's okay, because what I realized is, at least for me, uh, the question is the answer. I mean, question contains the concept of quest. So for me, that was a, a great revelation, and, and, and it did change me. Um, uh, I've tried to become more tolerant. I, th I think that it's very easy to get confused between being a uh, skeptic, as I am, a, I call myself a skeptical skeptic because I'm so skeptical, I'm skeptical of skepticism, <laughs> but, uh, and, and, and being a militant atheist because the militant atheist knows something. Now, I will agree with him that I, I don't think any organized religion that I know of has the answers. In fact, I find dogma generally repugnant and backward-looking, but... Um, I don't pretend to have the answer. I just have a lot of questions. And I, 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 there's this great anecdote that I heard, and I'm probably getting it totally wrong. I think it was Stephen Hawkins and John Paul II who were talking. And Stephen Hawkins said that soon we would be able to know exactly when the Big Bang happened and how it happened and how the universe uh, came out and went back in and all of these things. And, <clears throat> and the Pope said, hmm, yeah. Very good, and then I step in. <laughs> so that was the essence of a conversation, a very intense conversation I had with a Buddhist who had been a ma militant atheist and had asked himself all the hard questions and was still asking them, and uh, we had this very intense conversation. He ran a and b and... Um, and, and you know, that really made me think. Not that I hadn't read about, you know, Buddhism. I did martial arts for decades. I know it doesn't look like it, but uh, uh, I used to teach karate. I was a, the world's worst black belt. But, uh, uh, and, and I tried to learn about these things, and I tried to meditate. and whatnot. It never sank in. But on this walk, I ran into a lot of Buddhists, and I had two very intense conversations. So one thing to bear in mind is that France is a very secular state. It has been for a very long time. There are very few practicing Roman Catholics. So fewer than half of the people in France identify themselves as Christians. And of those, something like 7% actually go to church and say they believe. So that's very low. There are probably more Buddhists or people who have an inclination towards Buddhism in France today than there are Catholics. And there are certainly more practicing Muslims in France than either. So uh, we had a very interesting conversation with a, a Muslim chiropractor. His clientele is 90% uh, Christian pilgrims. And uh, <laughs> 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 he was very welcoming slightly baffled by people like us and why we would do this, but you know, he fixed Allison so she could make it down. <laughs> I hope I answered your question. Yeah, I don't want to be flippant. No, that's all right. Thank you. 
I've heard you go on about food and how important it is in your life, and I'm really intrigued to know more about the magnificent meal that you had that said th that when you said it was probably the best meal you ever had in France. You want the address. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know you didn't find it on TripAdvisor, so I'm curious no. how you came upon this, and I'm wondering if the meal was better because of the state you were in. Well, uh, we were definitely... Uh, uh, long and sharp and tooth by the time we got there, that's for sure. But uh, I think that when you're out and walking and breathing clean air, and uh, then you have a good appetite. So that added to it. But I, I don't think it was just that. Um, what I might do to answer you is read you. It's very short. I can read that to you if you want. I'll read you the description. Do we have time? Um, if I can find it. Um, let me see. Uh, 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 uh. I'm getting there. I if you were coming to New York, you could come to our literary lunch, and uh, I'm going to read all the food parts of the book. <laughs> ah, here we go. Found it. All right. This chapter is called, I've got to change this, sorry. Um, this chapter is called From Farmyard to Table. Well, I'm using my beat up um, advanced reader's copy, so I don't know if it's the same, but it's uh, 169. Um, essentially, we'd been hiking all day and had gotten lost and uh, had been uh, uh, stung by bees because we stumbled into the farmer's uh, honey making operation. <laughs> and. We were pretty tired and and beaten up, but we got to this farmhouse B and B. There's a class of um, uh, B and Bs in France uh, where they they get a special rating because they grow. I think it's over 80 percent or something of, of what what they serve at table, and you can only eat at this place if you spend the night. It's called Ferme de la Chassagne, by the way. Uh, the name is in the book, so since you're all buying multiple copies to give to your friends, you'll find it very easily. Um, uh, so we came down to din dinner, and this is where the scene starts. It's from farmyard to table. Anyway, be beautiful farm, beautifully tended uh, by this woman uh, who was living out a fantasy. She had been a, a hospital administrator uh, all her life, and she had just retired and was running this dream farm with her husband and uh, was incredibly good at what she did. You were there when the calf was born? The woman's tone merged urgency, disbelief, and guilt. And the cream from the calf's mother? By now she'd finished her portion of utterly unkosher, creamy, veal and mushroom stew. She gulped. But the animals, they're like pets. They're so cute. Jolly and roistering until now, the table fell silent. Françoise, the uh, lady who owned the place, was unflappable. That's what happens on farms, she said. You don't raise livestock for the fun of it. Jacques, her husband, a stocky, boisterous man well past 50, confirmed that everything on the table came from the farm. The orange-yellow, freshly churned butter, the goose pate we'd had for starters, everything. Even the mushrooms came from the woods. OK, we didn't make the wine, he laughed, pouring liberally from an old-fashioned demijohn and looking like a modern-day Bacchus. It comes from a friend's winery in Mercure. He makes it without sulfur, so it's practically organic. Drink to your heart's content. Our fellow diners took Jacques at his word 
as the Mère Curé refilled the ten wine glasses ranged around the big square table, I could see the moment of you killed the calf crisis passing. <laughs> All six paying guests and four family members sighed almost simultaneously. Yes, the dream farm life had its unpalatable flip side, populated by slaughterhouses and butcher knives. But even the sensitive, inquisitive Belgian lady with qualms about veal and mother's milk allowed Francoise to serve her a second time. It was quite simply the most succulent homemade veal and mushroom stew that I or anyone else at the B&B had ever eaten. We took turns saying so, some of us with crocodile tears. The goose pâté had been excellent too, and it struck me as odd that no one wondered if Francoise had played mother goose before wringing the bird's neck. <laughs> Patently, there was a hierarchy in our affections. As the conversation ranged wider, from Bar Brussels and Santiago, Gaul and Rome, to the inevitable America, Afghanistan, and Iraq, I felt a twitch of heartburn, wishing we wouldn't always be taken for ambassadors of our country's democratically elected administrations. Francoise's fresh goat cheese came to the rescue. It was tangy heaven on earth. The delicate apple tart, untainted by corn syrup and artificial anything, had a buttery shortbread crust as flaky as snow, the fruit filling still firm. I refused not to enjoy them. Voila. Yes, thank you uh, very much for your talk. I had a question about your description of the reaction of the French villagers to the approach of groups of pilgrims. Uh, my wife and I went to Navarra and the Basque Country, and we, walked, we were on part of a pilgrimage route, and we saw that there's a lot of infrastructure related to the pilgrimage route in Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, there are the hostels, there's um, a lot of... Uh, pilgrims, as you, as you mentioned, and I'm not imagining that in Spain you would get the same kind of reaction from a group of pilgrims coming into a Spanish village. What do you attribute your observations in France to, if you, if you, if you, can, if you can, uh, can describe that? Um, I think you need to start by reading Julius Caesar. Okay. Who? <laughs> um, well, let's see. Um, it's a really long route, and I'm not going to say that everywhere we went, the French villagers ran away from us. They didn't. Um, in fact, along the um, more the main line, put it that way, from Le Puy en Velay across the Massif Central and through the southwest and then over the Pyrenees, it's uh, very much like Spain in that it's all set up, and there are um, uh, hotels, B&Bs, hostels, restaurants, and the, the people in these places depend on the pilgrims for a livelihood. And so they see you coming and they, you know, put out the scallop shell mm -hmm. flag and they, so they, they don't run away from you in that part of France. Uh, and in Spain they're set up, the, the thing about Spain is it's a bit like Rome, um, I love Rome, but the Romans are, are terribly spoiled because they get so many million, 39, 40 million people a year. They don't have to make an effort, right? In Spain, it, it's a bit like that, but they're, they're also deeply into it. So uh, not just for commercial reasons, they're much more religious than the French or the Italians. And don't forget St. James, Santiago is the patron saint of of Spain, and this whole pilgrimage route, I didn't get into it because we would be here forever, but it was set up really to funnel in Christian soldiers, warriors, to drive out the Moors in the Reconquista, which took 700 years. So their whole view uh, of the pilgrimage route is completely rooted in the fact that it was there for geopolitical reasons initially dressed up as, mm -hmm. as religion. And so it has been there and it has been um, uh, in continuous use since the ninth century when the saints' relics were miraculously discovered. Unfortunately for certain people, the archeologists now tell us that those 
relics were the bones of two Romans whose villa was on the site. And uh, uh, but you know, mm. pe people are not going to believe that. They still believe that Mary Magdalene's relics are there. So in Beslay, but. To, to, to answer your question, I think the experience in Spain and in France is, is utterly different. The mm -hmm. French are generally um, uh, secular. They're rarely religious, even if they run a, a B and b for pilgrims. Mm -hmm. And um, in the northern areas or the, the areas that we walk through that are not on these main lines, um, it's a totally different reality. Mm -hmm. That's where the people ran away from oh, us. Uh, 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 elsewhere, they have a commercial sense. Mm -hmm. So, y if you if you uh, are concerned about having a, a, a good infrastructure for your hike and you don't, or, or your pilgrimage, and you don't mind hiking with many hundreds or thousands of other people always in front of you or behind you, then by all means, do 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 the Spanish one. Thank you. You're welcome. I think that's it, because otherwise everyone's starving to death, right? <laughs> or you all ate next door, right? Thank you. Thank you very much for coming.